Ministries brings you a new mini Bible college series, The Sermon on the Mount. Hi, I'm Bill Wright. Pastor Dick Woodward begins this series called The Sermon on the Mount with a basic introduction of the first Christian retreat. Having taken his disciples aside to the top of a small mount, Christ explains to his disciples how to handle all those problems at the bottom of the hill. Get your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 5, and let's study together. I'm excited to begin a new series of studies with you in this session on one of my favorite passages of Scripture, the Sermon on the Mount, which is found in the Gospel of Matthew in chapters 5, 6, and 7. The Sermon on the Mount is one of the basic teachings of Jesus, one of the great discourses of Jesus. His Mount Olivet Discourse was a great discourse. That's found in Matthew 24 and 25. And then, of course, the Upper Room Discourse, which we looked at when we studied the Gospel of John, is the longest recorded discourse of Jesus. But this discourse of Jesus is considered perhaps the most basic discourse of Jesus. It's uh, considered to uh, hold uh, the basic teaching of Jesus, the essence of the teaching of Jesus in terms of uh, his values and his ethics. There are people who say, you can take these three pages out of the Gospel of Matthew, uh, tear them out of your Bible, and throw the rest away. They think so much of the Sermon on the Mount. They think that the Sermon on the Mount is the essence of the whole Bible, ethically, and so it's really all you need. Well, I wouldn't go that far, but it certainly is an important discourse of Jesus. And in this first study of the Sermon on the Mount, I would like for us to see the Sermon on the Mount in its context. After we see the Sermon on the Mount in its context, I would like for us to see the Sermon on the Mount in terms of its content. But in this first study, let's consider the context of the Sermon on the Mount. One of the rules for Bible study is you should always learn to see passages of Scripture in their context. The word context means with the text. It's always important to see what comes with the text that you're uh, studying. Uh, what came before, what came after, what was going on at the time that the teaching was given. This is a very important rule for Bible study. So as we begin our study of the Sermon on the Mount, let's begin by considering the context of the Sermon on the Mount, the setting in which it was given. The Gospel of John just barely alludes to this in the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John. In John chapter 6, uh, it says that great multitudes of people are following Jesus at this particular point early in his ministry. And these multitudes have every kind of problem imaginable. And Jesus is uh, addressing those problems and healing people. And John simply tells us in John chapter 6, verses 2 and 3, that when Jesus saw all these crowds and all of their problems, he went up and sat on a mountain with his disciples. It really doesn't make a whole lot of sense as you read it in the Gospel of John. But John's purpose is not to report to us the Sermon on the Mount. John wrote last, and as we pointed out in studying the Gospel of John, 90% of what John tells us about, the other Gospel writers didn't tell us about. So it was not his purpose to give us the uh, Sermon on the Mount teaching. He does make reference, though, to the context or the setting in which it was given when it says that he went up on a mountain and there he sat with his disciples. It doesn't sound like anything very strategic the way John reports it. Mark gives us a little more information. Mark tells us in Mark chapter 3 verse 7 that Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea and a great multitude from Galilee followed, also from Judea and Jerusalem and Idumea and from beyond the Jordan, uh, and those from about Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude, hearing all that he did, came to him. And he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they should crush him. For he had healed many, so that uh, 
all who had diseases pressed upon him to touch him. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve to be with him and to be sent out to preach and to have authority to cast out demons. And then in Mark 3, we get the names of the twelve apostles whom he appointed. In the third chapter of Mark, Mark is telling us about this uh, period early in the ministry of Jesus when his healing ministry is at its zenith and people from these areas that are mentioned are coming to him because they've heard of his power to heal and he is healing every kind of problem imaginable. And in the middle of this great healing ministry which took place on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, the uh, area from the Sea of Galilee slopes up uh, into hills one uh, level after another. And it says that he just went up on the side of these hills. It calls it the mountain side in some translations. And he separated himself from the multitudes who were thronging him and crushing him and trying to touch him down there close to the Sea of Galilee. And apparently he withdrew to this upper level and invited, according to Mark 3.13, those whom he desired, by personal invitation, they met him at that higher level. And then at that higher level, uh, Matthew will tell us, he gave this teaching we call the Sermon on the Mount. In Mark chapter 3, between verses 13 and 14, you can put all of Matthew 5, all of Matthew 6, and all of Matthew 7. At the end of the teaching there in Matthew 7, very shortly after he comes off this mountainside, he commissions the 12 apostles according to Matthew's record. The way Mark reports it, he just goes up on this mountainside and invites certain people to join him there. And as a result of this meeting he has with them there, he appoints 12 to be with him and then to be sent out. So that's the way Mark reports to us the context of the Sermon on the Mount. Now let's come to Matthew. And at the end of Matthew 4, verse 23, we'll see Matthew's description of the context for this great teaching that we call the Sermon on the Mount. I'm reading from the NIV translation in Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. If you've got your Bible, you might want to turn there with me where we find these words. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, from the ten cities, from Jerusalem, from Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. Now when Jesus saw these multitudes, we're in chapter 5 now, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, and then you have Matthew 5, Matthew 6, Matthew 7, what we call the Sermon on the Mount. Do you see the context in which this great teaching was given? I call it the first Christian retreat. I believe it was something very strategic that Jesus did here on this occasion. You see, what Jesus did on this occasion was something like this. I've heard it said that if you want to be an effective executive, you have to learn to do five things. You have to learn to analyze, you have to learn to organize, you have to learn to deputize, and then supervise, and finally agonize. And that is how you become an effective executive. You analyze the situation, and then you organize your strategic approach to the situation. While you're organizing, you have to learn to deputize unless you want to do everything yourself uh, forever, you must successfully deputize. Then you supervise those you have deputized, and since they never do it the way you would, 
Instead of taking it back from them when they don't do it right, you have to learn to agonize over those you supervise. Well, there's a sense in which we could apply this to Jesus. He knows what his mission is. His mission is to meet the needs uh, that are represented by these crowds of people. These crowds of people with all their problems, I believe, represent the world and all the problems that the people of this world have, physical, uh, mental, emotional, and especially spiritual. You know, in our cultures, uh, where I live especially, I can drive one direction just a few minutes and come to a veterans hospital where there are thousands of veterans of our wars in the United States of America. There are basket cases with no arms and legs. There are double amputees. There are the paralyzed veterans who perhaps were shot in the lower back in some way paralyzed. There are those that have been blinded and disfigured. Uh, some of them have been there actually since World War I some since World War II, some since our Korean conflict, and some since Vietnam. Now, I can go each direction from where I live and come across one of these hospitals. And in these hospitals, you can walk through literally miles of corridors that are just filled with these veterans. There are rooms on either side of these long hallways and there are these veterans in all these rooms, as I've just described them. But you see, these veterans, with all of their problems, their physical problems because of the injuries they sustained during our wars, they're not out there in the street. You have to go seek them out. You have to go to one of uh, what we call our veterans' hospitals in order to find them. Uh, it's the same way with those that are mentally ill. The city in which I leave, the city in which I live has the mental hospital for the state of Virginia. And if you go to that mental hospital, then you can see those who have the mental problems and the emotional problems and have to be institutionalized because they couldn't hold up under the pressures of life or because they have some kind of a mental problem. The same thing's true with our old people. In our culture, uh, many of our old people end up in nursing homes. Some are affluent and some are not so affluent. But the aged, they're not out there in the streets either, any more than the veterans and the mentally ill are. In our culture, these things are institutionalized. They're isolated. They're out of sight, out of mind for most of us. We have to go looking for them if we have a special uh, concern for them. But in the day of Jesus, it wasn't like that. All these problems that we institutionalize today, they were just right out there in that multitude that he saw. All through the gospel records, it will say that when he saw these multitudes, he wept over them. And the suggestion of the Greek words is that his whole body convulsed with sobs over these multitudes because they were like sheep not having a shepherd. They didn't know their left hand from their right. And because all the problems that we institutionalize today were out there in those crowds, those pathetic, uh, pitiful crowds that he saw again and again. Now, that crowd, that multitude of people with their multitude of problems, they bring uh, before us, uh, they bring into focus for us the context in which the Sermon on the Mount was given. Jesus was ministering to these crowds, and he realized that in a body, as just one man, he could never uh, solve all these problems himself, even though he was the Son of God. So he analyzed, and then he organized what I call the first Christian retreat. He called together on that mountainside some of his disciples. And it seems to me that what he was saying to them at the first Christian retreat, which we call the Sermon on the Mount, was something like this. How would you like to be part of the solution to all those problems there in that crowd of people down there around the Sea of Galilee? How would you like to be part of the answer to all that need that you see down there? You see, when he organized this first Christian retreat, as I call it, he divided the multitude into two parts. After he 
organized his retreat there on the mountainside. At the bottom of the hill, around the Sea of Galilee, you still had the multitudes who were still part of the problem and part of the question. But there, uh, higher up uh, the side of the mountain, at this retreat Jesus has organized, you have the people who are staying by their presence there and responding to his invitation to join him there, that they would like to be part of the solution to all that at the bottom of the mountain, part of the answer to all of that. You see here Jesus, when you see the context in which he gives the teaching of Matthew 5, 6, and 7, is presenting a challenge. And the challenge is, are you part of the problem or are you part of the solution? Are you part of the answer or are you just another question mark? The challenge, of course, is, wouldn't you like to be part of the solution? Wouldn't you like to be part of the answer? Well, if you'll join me here at this retreat, Jesus is saying, I will show you through my teaching how you can be part of the answer and part of the solution, part of my answer, part of my solution to all those problems down there. And remember, the multitude at the bottom of the mountain represents the world with all of its problems, basically spiritual, but manifested or revealed through emotional, mental, physical problems. Now, after Jesus gets this retreat organized, it's his purpose at this retreat to deputize. He calls them disciples. You might call them deputies. He wants to make deputies or disciples. And then it's his plan that all that he has to share with the world, represented by that multitude, should be passed through the lives of these deputies or disciples. When he feeds the 5,000, you have a picture of this. We saw this in the Gospel of John. He could have fed the multitudes directly, but he didn't. He strategically placed the, the disciples, apostles as they're called by them, between him and that hungry crowd of people. And he passes the food that is miraculously multiplied through his hands, through their hands, into the hands of the hungry multitude. We call that the parable of the missionary vision of Jesus. Well, that's the kind of thing you see here as you examine the context of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, after he teaches Matthew 5 and Matthew 6 and Matthew 7, notice how the teaching comes to a conclusion. Beginning at verse 13 of Matthew 7, Jesus gives a great invitation. He's issuing a challenge here also. But the challenge here is not, are you part of the problem or part of the solution? Are you part of the answer or just another question mark? The challenge here is something like this. What kind of a solution are you? What kind of an answer are you? What kind of a disciple of mine? What kind of a deputy of mine do you want to be? That's the, the sense of this invitation with which he ends this great teaching. I won't read it all. But let's just kind of summarize it, and then you read it and see if this is true. Beginning at verse 13 and going through verse 14, Jesus seems to say this. There are two kinds of disciples. There are two kinds of solutions or answers or deputies. The many and the few. The many think there's an easy way to be part of my answer and part of my solution, one of my disciples. They think it all starts with a a wide gate, which is followed by a broad road, but they discover that that doesn't lead to being one of my solutions, one of my answers. That just uh, leads to destruction. And many who profess to be disciples are uh, on that broad road because they think that they can just follow the lines of least resistance. They think there's an easy way to be a solution and an answer, but they never become a solution or an answer. So he's challenging the people who attended that first retreat. By the way, he concluded the retreat. Now, when it comes to solutions and answers and disciples, uh, what kind of a disciple, what kind of a solution, what kind of an answer are you? Are you one of the many? One of the many who think there's an easy way to accomplish these things? Or are you one of the few? He said there are the few, the committed minority, you might call them, 
who know that in order to be my solution to my answer, it's going to have to start with a small gate or a narrow gate. And that narrow gate's going to be followed by a difficult, disciplined way. But people who discover this, they do become one of my answers and one of my solutions, one of my true disciples. So the challenge is, are you one of the many or one of the few? And this has to do with the kind of disciple we are. Now, the next part of his invitation at the end of Matthew 7 is, there are the false and the true. It's no surprise to Jesus that the church is a mixed multitude. He taught in the parable of the wheat and the tares that it would be so. He said that you have the Father, apparently, planting wheat in this field, which is the world. But an enemy plants tares or weeds among the wheat. And the question is asked when he gives this parable in Matthew 13. Uh, did you not plant good seed in your field? Where did the weeds come from or the tares? And then the question is asked, do you want us to weed the garden? And the answer is, oh no, because you'll never tell the difference between the wheat and the weeds or the wheat and the tares. Let both grow together. And at the harvest, which is the judgment time, I'll weed the garden. I'll separate the wheat from the tares. It's no surprise to Jesus that you have the false and the true among his professing disciples. At the end of this invitation, at the conclusion of this retreat in Matthew 7, the second part of his invitation is this challenge. Are you one of the false or one of the true uh, solutions, answers, disciples of mine? And then the rest of the seventh chapter uh, focuses the third part of his invitation. He says, there are many who say, but there are very few who do, who really do my will uh, and the Father's will. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, and I will say to them, I never knew you. Get away from me, you evildoers. Those are some of the most awesome words in the Bible. People will come to him at the judgment, and they will sum up their lives with the three words, many wonderful works. That's the way it is in the King James translation. And Jesus will evaluate their lives with three words also. He will say, workers of iniquity. And then he will say, I never knew you. So you weren't really the people who were doing my will and the will of the Father. You were just talkers. A lot of people think that the kingdom of God or the church of Christ or the cause of Christ is just a matter of semantics. Theological semantics, getting it said right or agreeing on how it should be said as if it were all a matter of saying. Well, here Jesus says in the third part of his invitation, are you one of those who say or are you one of those who do? Are you just a talker? Is your faith just a lot of theological semantics, just a lot of religious talk? Or, by the grace of God, are you one of those who do, who really do the will of the Father as revealed through me? Someone has said, what we really believe we do, all the rest is religious talk. That seems to be the way the Lord concludes this teaching we call the Sermon on the Mount. Well, there you have the context of the Sermon on the Mount, the context in which the teaching is given. It's great teaching of Jesus. We'll look at the content in overview in our next study. But before we come to the content of what he taught here at this first Christian retreat, let's consider the context in which he taught it. The great challenge to you and me is this. Are you part of the problem or are you part of the solution? Are you part of the answer or just another question mark? Are you part of his solution or part of the problem? Are you part of the uh, answer that Jesus brought into this world or are you just another question mark? That's the great challenge we find as we consider the context of the Sermon on the Mount. Remember that all the teaching of Matthew 5, 6, and 7 will be given in this context. And we should see it that way. Never lose sight of those multitudes that are described so vividly in John 6 and Mark 3 and at the end of Matthew 4. 
because all the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount was directed toward them through the disciples, the deputies of Jesus. All the problems represented in that multitude represent the problems of this world and the people of this world. According to Matthew, the first thing Jesus did at the beginning of his public ministry was to organize this retreat at which he could recruit solutions and answers, people who would be his solutions and his answers to all the problems represented in the multitudes of the people of this world. Thank you for listening to the Sermon on the Mount series presented by our teacher, Pastor Dick Woodward. Our hope is that you will grow in the knowledge of the scriptures and discover their devotional meaning as it applies to your life. This is part of the Mini Bible College, a ministry of International Cooperating Ministries.